Today, we begin our study of the book of Isaiah, which on manifold planes is, of course, a monumental task. And perhaps the best way to begin this study may be to introduce study of the prophets generally before we even consider the opening words of the book of Isaiah that clearly place the book of Isaiah in a context of time specific kings it may be most helpful for us to begin by considering something that I know is often a source of confusion in particular in the way we Jews study the Bible and that pertains to one word and the different ways we use that word Torah because on the one hand as undoubtedly everyone is aware we use the word Torah to refer in particular to the first division of the Hebrew Bible the five books of Moses and indeed in the Hebrew text, the word Torah is explicitly used repeatedly in Deuteronomy and also in the book of Joshua, where unambiguously it refers to the five books of Moses. So in the most limited, restrictive, rigorous sense, we use the word Torah to refer to that part of the Bible. And yet, we also use the word Torah to refer to far more expansive ideas that pertain to God's Word. For example, applying the term, the written Torah, to refer to the entire Hebrew Bible. Now, of course, inevitably, the root of the problem here is when we consider the meaning of the word Torah. As we've noted on many occasions, the word Torah means teaching. Well, obviously, God teaches us many things. And God's teachings obviously take place on many levels. So it shouldn't surprise us, then, that the word Torah can indeed be applied on many levels, indeed levels in addition to these two fairly obvious ones. So, of course, then there is that lingering ambiguity when we speak, for example, of studying the Torah. Are we referring to studying the five books of Moses? Or, for that matter, are we also referring to studying the book of Isaiah, to studying the prophets? Of course, it should be clear that in general, when we speak of engaging in study of Torah, Certainly, any study of God's Word and His will is study of Torah, and what we're doing here, studying the book of Isaiah, is likewise studying the Torah. But I think it is important for us to stress this ambiguity, because while we can certainly use the word Torah in this expansive sense, there is a difference. It's subtle, but it's crucial. And I think it has critical implications with respect to the way we should be approaching a book like Isaiah. Specifically, while we, of course, regard the entire Hebrew Bible as a revelation of God's will, as, in some sense, God's Word, there is a distinction that we draw between the Torah, in the sense of the five books of Moses, and that broader sense of the written Torah pertaining to the entire Bible. And maybe a good way of expressing this is by our considering the unique manner in which the person who serves as the conduit 
in conveying to us the Torah in that more restrictive sense is described in it. I refer, of course, to Moses, and maybe that's really the most critical consideration to bear in mind in understanding the uniqueness of the five books of Moses. To consider in brief three relevant passages, first in Exodus chapter 6, beginning in verse 2, God spoke unto Moses and said to him, I am God, using the tetragrammaton, God's ineffable name, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, the tetragrammaton, I made me not known to them. That is, Moses here is compared to the patriarchs, to the great prophets who came before him. And, of course, not intending any derogation of their level, Moses' level of prophecy is distinct, unique with respect to theirs that pertains to the prophets who preceded it. In Numbers chapter 12, we read about the two greatest other prophets who were contemporaries of his. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 5, God came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the door of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, do make myself known unto him in a vision. I do speak with him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so. He is trusted in all my house. Verse 8, With him do I speak mouth to mouth even manifestly, or perhaps better rendered as, and with sight, that is not by allegories. And the similitude of God he beholds. Wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant against Moses? So with respect to his contemporaries, again, his level of prophecy is distinct. He is unique. And finally, most critically, at the end of Deuteronomy, after Moses has left this world, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10, and there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom God knew face to face. Now, of course, we're not going to discuss right now what these expressions, the similitude of God, face-to-face, and so on, mean in any rigorous sense. It's sufficient for us simply to appreciate the uniqueness, the exclusivity, even the discontinuity between the level of prophecy of Moses and the level of prophecy of everyone else. Because as a result of this uniqueness, this exclusivity, this discontinuity. The revelation of God through Moses is qualitatively unique, distinct from anyone else's. In our expression, we describe the level of prophecy of Moses as providing us with eternal instruction. Because Moses transcends the level of the distinctive subjectivity that applies to the rest of humanity. He serves as a direct conduit, so to speak, of God's eternal truths, hence eternal instruction. Now, by contrast, we don't describe the words of all the other prophets as attaining that level. Their instruction is grounded in time, grounded in a context. It is, in that sense, not eternal instruction, but rather temporal instruction. And yet, simultaneously, lest this be misconstrued as a swipe 
at the other prophets, God forbid. Obviously, these words of the other prophets that are included in the Bible are included for a reason. Indeed, in our tradition, there were many other prophets, but their words were not recorded for posterity because specifically the words of the prophets that are recorded in the Bible are needed by all generations. We continuously return to these prophecies and seek and find in them lessons for ourselves, lessons for our world, lessons for our lives. So the conclusion here is admittedly somewhat subtle, but I feel compelled to stress it because it's also critical. We're not going to relate to the words of all of the prophets other than Moses as eternal instruction, divorced in some sense from any temporal context in which they may have been recorded. We therefore need to consider what that context is, but not because we're going to relate to the other prophets as something to be examined as merely a historical curiosity, God forbid. On the contrary, we need to consider the context in order to better integrate the lessons, and thus, in order to better understand how they continue to impact upon our lives. So, it is in that context, then, that we embark upon our study of Isaiah, on the one hand, recognizing that his lessons are indeed timeless. But on the other hand, in order to appreciate the import of those timeless lessons, to, ironically, anchor them in their times, in their contexts, to better understand them, and ultimately, to better integrate those lessons into how we live our lives. With that, as an introductory note, we embark upon the first verse of Isaiah. Verse 1, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Yotam, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of the kings of Judah. Of course, these are consecutive kings in the Davidic dynasty that reigned over Judah. And now, in order to be able to fulfill the mission we just outlined a few moments ago, we need to consider who were these kings. Well, turns out we know quite a bit about them. We read about them both in the book of Kings and in the book of Chronicles. And before we continue in the book of Isaiah, I think it's instructive for us to consider what we do indeed learn about these kings and their generations in those two other books of the Bible. What's especially tantalizing here is that in the cases of each of these kings, while predictably there's an awful lot that overlaps between what we read in the book of Kings and what we read in the book of Chronicles, there's also a critical aspect for each one that diverges. So we're going to need to consider both the book of Kings 
and the Book of Chronicles in order to properly integrate the necessary conclusions that enable us to understand the messages of Isaiah to our lives. So let's begin with the first of these kings. At the beginning of the book of Isaiah, he is identified as Uziah. He is likewise thus identified in the two additional instances in which his name appears. For the most part, in the book of Kings, Kings 2, beginning in the citations at the end of chapter 14 and here at the beginning of chapter 15, he is identified as Azariah. Azariah and Uziah, while obviously phonetically different, have the same connotation when one considers the etymology of these names in Hebrew. The name Uziah appears in Kings as well. I'm merely noting this so it won't be a point of confusion. We're certainly speaking of the same individual. At the beginning of the second book of Kings, chapter 15, we read about the beginning of his reign. In the 27th year of Yerabam, king of Israel, began Azariah, son of Amasiah, king of Judah, to reign. 16 years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Yehoyahu of Jerusalem. And right off the bat, we read what certainly should strike us as a very encouraging message. And he did that which was upright in the eyes of God, according to all that his father Amasya had done. Now, on the one hand, this obviously is to his credit. He did that which was upright in the eyes of God. And yet, when one considers the qualifier, according to all that his father Amatsya had done, one can't help but wonder, what is this phrase coming to add? That is, if the verse would have only told us he did that which was upright in the eyes of God, we would have taken that as an unqualified statement that he did everything that was upright in the eyes of God. When you add, according to all that his father Amatsya had done, well, that means he did everything upright that his father Amatsya had also done. That doesn't necessarily mean everything. And that brings us to the next verse. Howbeit the high places were not taken away, the people still sacrificed and offered in the high places. Now, before we continue, we need to clarify what this business of the high places was. We encounter it on quite a number of instances in the Bible. And it's important to clarify that, on the one hand, we are not speaking of idolatry. It isn't some pagan worship of other gods. What it is, however, is a forbidden way of worshiping God. And this is something that is perhaps especially clear in Deuteronomy chapter 12, where we read of the mandates, the instructions that Moses gives us upon entry into the land of Israel. These are the statutes and ordinances that you will observe to do in the land that God, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess it all the days you live upon the earth, on the land of Israel. Second verse in chapter 12, you shall surely destroy all the places wherein the nations you are dispossessed served their gods, upon the high mountains, high places, and upon the hills and under every leafy tree. And the emphasis in Moses' words here, verse 4, is you shall not do so unto God your Lord. Rather, verse 5, unto the place that God your Lord shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall you seek, and there shall you come. And, of course, there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes, and the offerings of your hand and your vows and your freewill offerings and the firstlings of your herd and of your flock. 
you're supposed to bring all of those offerings exclusively to the temple. As we read in the continuation of the chapter, in verse 8, you shall not do after all that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Rather, once you come into the promised land, verse 11, it shall come to pass that the place which God your Lord shall choose to cause his name to dwell there, there shall you bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the offering of your hand, and all your choice vows, which you vow unto God. And moreover, the repeated warning in verse 13, take heed to yourself that you not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in the place that God will choose in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. In other words, to summarize, once again, when we consider what was taking place in the time of Uziahu, and indeed, during the reigns of most of the righteous kings of Judah, the temple was standing in Jerusalem. No offerings were permitted to be brought anywhere else, but the people were still engaging in a manner of serving God that mimicked the way the various pagan nations had served their gods. It wasn't that in Israel the Jews were engaging in idolatry here. They were serving God, but they were serving God in a forbidden manner, which inevitably, because of the associations with the way the pagan nations served their gods, indicated a certain lack of purity in their devotion to God. But again, the general assessment, we return to verse 3 here, is that Azariah, also known as Uziah, did that which was upright in the eyes of God. And it is therefore a source of wonderment that we read in verse 5, and God smote the king, so that he was a leper, smitten with the plague of Tzarah. He was a Mitzorah, unto the day of his death, and dwelt in a house set apart. Why? And tantalizingly, the book of Kings just tells us that God smoked the king. It doesn't say a word by way of explanation. To get the explanation, we need to turn to the second book of Chronicles, chapter 26, where we also read about the same king, here identified as Uziah, 16 years old, was Uziah when he began to reign. He reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Yechaliah of Jerusalem. Same biographical data that we already saw in the book of Kings. And likewise, in the very same terms that we saw in the book of Kings, he did that which was upright in the eyes of God according to all that his father Amatzia had done. And moreover, here we find greater elaboration. And he set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the vision of God. And as long as he sought God, God made him prosper. Now the ellipsis at the end of verse 5 indicates that we have another 10 verses that detail the extraordinary successes, military successes, economic successes, general, extraordinary success that was enjoyed by Uziah, culminating in verse 15, where we read at the end of the verse that his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. And then, with verse 16, comes a turning point. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up so that he did corruptly, and he trespassed against God his Lord, for he came into the temple of God to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Something, of course, 
that is permissible only to the priests. And Azariah, the chief priest, came in after him and with him 80 priests of God who were valiant men and they withstood Uzziah the king and said to him, it pertains not to you, Uzziah, to burn incense unto God, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron that are consecrated, it pertains to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. Neither shall it be for your honor from the God of Israel, from the Lord. And in verse 19, then Uzziah was wroth, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, Sarat, here rendered as leprosy, broke forth on his forehead before the priests in the house of God beside the altar of incense. Sarat is one of the chief causes of ritual defilement. Azariah, the chief priest of all the priests, looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous, smitten with Sarat in his forehead, and they thrust him out quickly from thence. They himself made haste also to go out because God had sent them. He realized it was over. Verse 21, And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a house set apart being a leper. Almost exactly the same words that we saw in the book of Kings. And Yotam is king. His son was over the king's house judging the people of the land. Just what we didn't get in the book of Kings was the explanation. For he was cut off from the house of God. Now, we should note, Oziah may have even had the best of intentions. After all, he had so much to thank God for having given him such extraordinary prosperity. So he was looking for a way of expressing his thanks. He made the great intentions. But as we know from Dante, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And irrespective of whether his intentions may have been good, the actions were unpardonable. And Uziah was smitten with Sarat, and to hear his leprosy for the rest of his life. So, on the one hand, we still relate to Uziah as a paragon of righteousness. And yet, on the other hand, things are obviously not perfectly well and good as we might have hoped. And needless to add, with all the vast military and economic exploits, Uziah's life ended in disgrace. That was the first of the kings whom we noted on the list at the beginning of Isaiah. Let's continue with the second of these kings, the son of Uziel, the one who ran the caretaker government during the duration of his father's life because he could no longer dwell in the city. In Kings 2, again in chapter 15, now, from verse 32. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliahu, king of Israel, began Yatam, the son of Uziah, king of Judah, to reign. Twenty-five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Yusha, the daughter of Tzadok. And once again, in verse 34, we read, almost exactly the same accolade regarding Yotam that had been paid to his father. And he did that which was upright in the eyes of God. He did according to all that his father Uziah had done. Meaning, 
Well, if our supposition is accurate, he is reckoned as upright in the eyes of God, but subject to this qualifier that it's only according to what his father Uzziah had done. So, for example, his father Uzziah, like his grandfather Amaziah, had tolerated the high places. That is, again, that illegitimate, forbidden manner of serving God. And it still, of course, persisted. Howbeit, the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and offered in the high places. Simultaneously, there is the additional praise meted out to Yotam. He built the upper gate of the house of God. So, he's engaging in temple renovations, even as the people are, at least to some degree, neglecting the temple in favor of their local high places where they brought their sacrifices. For now, nonetheless, we would certainly stress he's being described as righteous. He even built the upper gate of the house of God. And yet, in verse 37, in those days, God began to send against Judah, Ritzin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah. And uh, once again, the book of Kings is tantalizingly reticent. We're really given no reason for this divine retribution in the generation of Yotham, which inevitably prompts us, once again, to take a look at the book of Chronicles. We read about King Yotham, in chapter 27 of the second book of Chronicles, beginning at the beginning of the chapter, Yotam was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and so on. Everything that we already saw, after all, in the book of Kings as well. And in verse 2, likewise, we see the self-same accolade that had been given him in the book of Kings, he did that which was upright in the eyes of God according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Again, that qualifier. But here, there's more. Howbeit, he entered not into the temple of God. Interesting, isn't it? What does this mean, he entered not into the temple of God? Inevitably, there's more than one possibility. One possibility is that while he did all that was upright in the eyes of God, according to all that his father Uzziah had done, he did not emulate everything that his father Uzziah had done, because even if his father had great intentions, his father also trespassed, entered into the temple of God in the sense of entering into the sanctuary, in a domain that was forbidden to him, permissible only to the priests that had been consecrated. So here we're told that Yotam maintained the appropriate distance. He did not follow his father Uzziah in this forbidden trespass. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that he didn't enter the, tem into the temple of God at all. That is, maybe he was so traumatized by what had befallen his father in the temple that he kept away from the temple entirely, brought his offerings only on those high places where the people continued to worship and serve God in a forbidden manner. Well, which possibility? Habir, he entered not into the temple of God, is intended as another accolade, or as another qualifier on his uprightness. The truth is, we don't know. 
On the one hand, we do have an ancient tradition that Yotam was considered extraordinarily righteous, practically unparalleled among all of the kings of Judah and Israel. And at least to some extent, we could summon support for that position from verse 6, where we read after his military exploits against Ammon, Yotam became mighty because he ordered his ways before God his Lord. And yet, returning again to verse 2, irrespective of what these additional phrases mean in speaking of his uprightness as being according to all that his father would have done and that he didn't enter the, into the temple, the verse ends, and the people did yet corruptly. And we don't know exactly what the object of that chastisement is either. Is it simply another way of saying what we've already seen over the course of these two generations and a great deal more in the Book of Kings? That is, what, he had, what we saw about the high places were not taken away, the people still sacrificed and offered in the high places. Is that the corruption here? Is there something more insidious that is left unstated? On the one hand, of course, a generation is to a great extent gauged and judged by its leaders. But it's also gauged and judged by itself. And even if Yotam is gauged personally as of exemplary righteousness, the assessment here of his generation is the people did yet corruptly. And who knows? Perhaps it is as a reflection of that corruption that we read back in the book of Kings in verse 37 about God beginning to send against Judah, Ritzim, the king of Aram, and Pekach, the son of Ramayahu. That is, things on the surface may have appeared very good. There's something deeply rotten beneath the surface. And there is at least the beginning of divine retribution for it. That's the second king, the second generation that is listed in the opening verse of Isaiah. We continue with the third king, and unfortunately, with respect to the third king, there is a good deal less ambiguity because the assessment in both the Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles is this is a king who was bad. In the beginning of chapter 16 of the second Book of Kings, in the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Revayau, Ahaz, the son of Yotam, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and he did not that which was upright in the eyes of God, his Lord, like David, his father. Now, at this stage, of course, the initial assessment is obviously not positive, but one could argue it's not that terrible, and after all, to say that he didn't measure up to the extraordinarily lofty standard of David, his father, Okay, so he wasn't that righteous. Doesn't say he was that wicked, uh, but we continue. In verse 3, he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen nations, whom God had cast out before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and offered in the high places, and on the hills, and under every leafy tree. Now, 
still isn't clear, at least in the Book of Kings, it's not clear whether this was forbidden worship of God or it was actually idolatry serving other gods. We'll seek clarification of this point shortly in Chronicles. But what you already observe in the Book of Kings is the geopolitical, military ramifications of the depravity of Ahaz. In verse 5, then Ritzim, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramayahu, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war. And they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. Now, on the one hand, of course, that sounds like a great relief, until one considers that not being able to overcome him means that they may have laid waste to land. They may have caused grievous damage. Again, we'll see shortly what the Book of Chronicles has to tell us. Just, they didn't actually sack Jerusalem. Indeed, we read precisely the same description at the beginning of chapter 7 in Isaiah. It came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Yotam, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that it seemed the king of Aram and Pekah, son of Ramayahu, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Simultaneously, going back to the book of Kings, in verse 6, we do read of the defeats of Judah. At that time, Ratzim, king of Aram, recovered Elat to Aram and drove the Jews from Elat. And the Edomites came to Elat and dwelt there unto this day. So there are manifest military defeats that are described in the time of Ahaz. What was described in the Book of Kings regarding the beginning of the incursions of Ritzin and Pekach in the time of Yatam, at this stage, gather momentum and have far more ruinous ramifications. Now again, we consider the message in Chronicles, second book of Chronicles, chapter 28, beginning characteristically, as we saw in the book of Kings, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not that which was upright in the eyes of God like David his father. Here, we get a far more explicit assessment, however. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images for the Baalim. That's idolatry. That's not a legitimate service of God. That's serving other gods. Moreover, he were offered in the valley of the son of Enom and burnt his children in the fire according to the abominations of the heathen nations whom God cast out before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and offered in the high places and on the hills and under every leafy tree. Same words that we saw in the book of Kings, but here, given what we already saw in verse 2, we realize this is idolatry. And so, in verse 5, we read, Wherefore, God his Lord delivered him into the hand of the king of Aram, and he smote him and carried away of his a great multitude of captives, and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. For Pekah, the son of Remaliahu, that's the king of Israel, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, all of them valiant men, because they had forsaken God, the God of their fathers. Staggering numbers. 120 thousand casualties in a day. And it hits close to home. Zichri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Masiah, the king's son, and Azrikam, the ruler of his house, and Elkanah, who was the king's viceroy. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. Devastating consequences. And we understand the context. 
because inevitably what I hope is becoming clear to us all is even as we read history in the books of Kings and in the books of Chronicles, they're not history books. They're telling us about an ongoing dialogue, a painful dialogue, a calamitous dialogue, a tragic dialogue between God and Israel and Judah here, where either the king or the people or both are communicating a message of rebelliousness, of disdain. And God, who never seeks simply to smite, but does seek to reform and rehabilitate, punishes grievously in the hope of our finally waking up. It is on that note that we move on to the fourth and last king on the list in the first verse of Isaiah. And this is, thankfully, the story of the manifestly most righteously described king of them all, beginning at the start of chapter 18 in the second book of Kings, and came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty-five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty-nine years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Avi, the daughter of Zechariah. Here, we don't read the same kind of qualifier that pertained to his grandfather and great-grandfather. He did that which was upright in the eyes of God according to all that David his father had done. Well, here of course the text couldn't really have told us anything about according to all that his father Ahaz had done because his father Ahaz was not doing what was upright in the eyes of God at all. But it also doesn't compare him to his grandfather and great-grandfather. Rather, according to all that David his father had done. And the implications should be clear. Again, his righteous grandfather and great-grandfather still condoned, if not actively participated in, the forbidden worship of God on the high places. For him, King Hezekiah, King Chizkiahu, we read in verse 4, he removed the high places, broke the monuments, cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces, he crushed the brazen serpent that Moses had made for unto those days the children of Israel did offer to it and it was called the Kushtan. That is, this is the brazen serpent that Moses makes in the wilderness after the nation complains unjustly regarding the manna and becomes rebellious against Moses. He makes the brazen serpent in fulfillment of God's command, but it then became an object of an idolatrous cult. So King Hezekiah, without giving any undue respect to such a venerable artifact, destroys it to eliminate that aspect of idolatry as well, that cult that had developed around the serpent. And we read in verse 5, he trusted in God, the God of Israel. The continuation, which is undoubtedly to his praise, but it's kind of sad when one considers the implications, is, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among them that were before him. 
that is, he trusted in God alone. Unfortunately, they, all the rest, before and after, did not. For he cleaved to God, he departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which God commanded Moses. And the consequence, God was with him. With this, wherever he went forth, he prospered, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. He smote the Philistines unto Gaza, and the borders thereof, from the tower of the watchmen to the fortified city. Great exploits, great successes. We will inevitably need to consider the life and times of King Zechia, King Chizkiah at Peter Lane, because he is much more a direct focus, both in the Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles, and for our purposes, most importantly, in the Book of Isaiah as well. But for now, this will suffice. Now, in Chronicles chapter 29, in the second Book of Chronicles, we read some greater specificity and this is undoubtedly significant likewise in our forming a picture of the king and of the generation. The chapter begins, predictably, Ezekiah Chizkiah began to reign when he was 25 years old. He reigned nine, 20 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abiyah, daughter of Zephariah. And he did that which was upright in the eyes of God again according to all that David, his father, had done. And beginning in verse 3, additional specificity, he in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of God and repaired, reinforced them. And then, in verse 4, he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the broad place on the east. And he said to them, Hear me, you Levites. Now sanctify yourselves and sanctify the house of God, the God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. For our fathers have acted treacherously and done that which was evil in the sight of God our Lord and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of God and turned their backs. Also, they have shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lamps, and have not burnt incense, nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore, the wrath of God was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he has delivered them to be a horror and astonishment and a hissing, as you see with your eyes. He's talking about devastation. Remember, we got a very clear picture of the horrific devastation wrought against Judah by both and it's seen the king of Aram and Pekah, the, the king of Israel, in the previous generation during the time of Ahaz. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with God, God of Israel, that his fierce anger may turn away from us speak of a calamitous period. And again, calamities that take place on the outside because of something that's not right on the inside. Now, of course, thus far, we certainly would be entitled to conclude that the corruption was all over and done with. It pertained to the generation of Ahaz, his father, not to him, right? Right? Not exactly right. Because in the second book of Chronicles, in chapter 32, verse 24, we read, in those days, Ezekiah Hizkiah was sick even unto death, and he prayed unto God, and he spoke unto him and gave him a sign. Now, we read of the sickness of King Hizkiah, not only in Chronicles, also in the Book of Kings, and in Isaiah as well. But there's an additional dimension that appears in Chronicles here that doesn't appear in 
those sources. Once again, Chronicles provides us with an additional insight. In verse 25, that Hezekiah, Hezekiah rendered not according to the benefit done unto him. For his heart was lifted up. Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Now, it doesn't end on that bleak note, because in verse 26 we read, Notwithstanding, Hezekiah, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of God came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah, the days of Hezekiah. We will yet need to consider what that pride of heart was and what the humbling was that followed. But while, in a way, the conclusion isn't too bleak because he did humble himself, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, still, first of all, recall the ominous words in Verse 25, therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. And second of all, even in verse 26, so the wrath of God came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah, makes it rather clear to us it's only a temporary reprieve. Things are not well. Things are definitely not well in the global climate, where there are major problems taking place in the world at large. Of course, for generations, there were almost continual border skirmishes between Judah and Aram, Judah and the Kingdom of Northern Israel, also with Edom, Ammon, Moab, there were a lot of problems of that sort. So what's also taking place in this period is the amassing of empires of proportions completely unprecedented. That is, we read in the life and times of Ahaz, of the ascendancy of the Assyrian Empire, that of course eventually destroyed the kingdom of northern Israel and exiled the ten tribes far, far away. The Assyrian Empire laid siege to Jerusalem as well in the time of King Hezekiah. We're speaking of a period of tremendous upheaval on the outside and on the inside. On the inside, the realization that what's taking place on the outside is a reflection of moral turmoil within. And that inevitably forces us to consider just what the prophet Isaiah is going to teach us in this regard. Now, we'll note one final point briefly, and that is that whatever we read in the first chapter of Isaiah, ironically, we should appreciate is not the beginning of Isaiah. At least, it's not the first prophecy of Isaiah, because the appointment of Isaiah as prophet is something about which we read in chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw God sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And in verse 8, I heard the voice of God saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. That was when the prophet was inaugurated as prophet. And yet, it's not the opening chapter of Isaiah. The opening chapter of Isaiah decries the rebellion of Israel. Children have I reared and brought up. They have rebelled against me. 
the ox knows its owner, the ass is master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people does not consider a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that deal corruptly, they have forsaken God, they have condemned the Holy One of Israel, they are turned away backward. What is he talking about? That's the challenge. Now that we have some idea of what the historical background of Isaiah is, we are in position to ask the critical next question. The next question is, so, this dire prophecy that we read in chapter 1, to whom is it addressed? What's going on? And what were the circumstances that prompted the prophet to say what he said? When we consider the four kings whom we just listed, there is, of course, a very obvious answer as to which reign would have prompted the kind of castigation that we read in Isaiah chapter 1. There is an obvious answer. And upon a bit of reflection, inevitably, it will emerge that the obvious answer is wrong. Considering just who was the king in the generation that is addressed in the first prophecy recorded in Isaiah. Not his first prophecy, but the prophecy that was deemed the critical starting point for the book of Isaiah and its message to us. Considering that, will present to us I think, not just a critical key to unlocking this prophecy of chapter one, but a critical key to unlocking the entire book. To appreciate the themes, to appreciate the messages. And once again, I'll stress, by understanding the times in which the words of the prophet are here anchored to be able to discern the timeless lessons that come from them. Again, this isn't the five books of Moses. And considering context, considering circumstance, it is definitely relevant. It's relevant precisely in order to be able to integrate from these words, what their timeless lessons to us are. And it is then on that note that we will continue, God willing, next time in exploring the balance of Isaiah chapter 1. And through considering the context, consider the content, understand the message, by learning the lessons, to be able to access also, the words of consolation, remedy, healing, blessing. So we continue in order to be able to access the blessing that comes from understanding the prophet's message to us. God bless you.